Hey everybody, I'm Pastor Matt Schultz here at Gateway City Church, and I just want to send out a special welcome to you wherever you are watching from today. We'd love to be able to hear from you and get in contact with you. If you'd like to be on our contact list and get to know Gateway better, I would encourage you to fill out one of our online connection forms at the bottom right hand side of our website. If you're in Canada and if you send us your mailing address, we'd love to send you a gift with a Tim Hortons gift card along with it. Hope to hear from you soon. In Philippians 2, the author Paul says this, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, and even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Lord, we thank you for Sundays. We thank you for a community of faith. I pray that we would receive your words this morning and adopt our hearts to be more like yours. Teach us to humble ourselves. Teach us to work out our salvation in fear and trembling. Teach us Christ-likeness. We submit this morning to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
is for you. He really is, and it's so obvious. And God is for all of us. He wants to see us succeed. That is the God that we serve. We are in this series that I'm doing through the summer called Jesus in the Old Testament. We preach about Jesus all the time, and that is our focus. Most of the time that leads us in the New Testament, but it's really neat for us to actually go into the Hebrew Scriptures, go into the Old Testament, and find Jesus there. If you're aware of the Old Testament, you're aware of the Hebrew Scriptures, you recognize that in the New Testament. Uh, The writers of the New Testament was constantly referring back to the Old Testament. Sometimes we miss it because we're just not 100% familiar with it, but it was, it's all in there. So today we're going to continue. We're continuing with the story of Jacob. But before we do that, I have a short video to show you. It gives us a little bit of a summary of where we're coming from in two minutes. So if we can watch that video right now and then I'll... We're walking through the book of Genesis, which is made up of these two main parts. And the first part begins in the garden, where we watch humanity spiral downward in self-destruction. And it ends in the Tower of Babel, where a rebellious humanity is scattered by God. Then the second part of Genesis zooms in and focuses on just one family. And right in the middle is this story that links the two parts of Genesis together and helps us understand what the whole book is all about. So how do we get from the Tower of Babel to the story here in the middle? Well, after the scattering at Babel, there's this genealogy, and it follows one of the tribes all the way down to this one guy named Abram. You probably know him as Abraham. And God starts making all these promises to Abraham, like he's going to bless him and give him a ton of kids. And he says that through him and his family, All the nations of the earth are now going to find God's blessing. So basically, God is trying to restore humanity back to the goodness of the garden and to his original intentions for the world. So it's like his rescue plan for humanity. And that's why the whole second half of Genesis is about this one family. And so you have have Abraham, and then he has a son, Isaac, who has Jacob, and then Jacob has 12 sons. And to each generation, God renews his promise to bless them and all nations through them. So because of this promise to use this family to rescue the world, It's pretty easy to read these stories as examples of how to be a good person. But actually, for the most part, this family is totally dysfunctional. So, for example, let's go back to Abraham. This whole story is about God giving him and his wife Sarah a family, but two different times. He basically gives Sarah away 
to other men by denying that she's even his wife. And then Sarah gets impatient about having a son, and so she makes Abraham sleep with her servant girl, which then causes all of these other problems in the family. So they get really old, and you begin to think that there's no way they're going to have a kid of their own. But then, miraculously, they do. It's Isaac. And Isaac, he has two sons, Esau and Jacob, and it seems like things are going pretty good. But Jacob... The younger brother wants the family's inheritance, which belongs to Esau, the older brother. So he devises a plan where he's going to steal it from his father, Isaac, who at this point in the story is now old and blind. Which who does that horrible stealing from your blind father? Yeah, and then he just takes off. So that gives us a little bit of a backstory with what we are talking about today. This story of God reaching out to humanity that continues to spiral down into destruction and chaos and this rescue plan that God has through one family. And so a couple weeks ago, uh, we talked about Abraham. And uh, Abraham had Isaac. Actually, I should probably say, you know, Abraham and Sarah. It takes two people to have a child, does it not? And, uh, and they have Isaac, and Isaac and Rebecca end up having two other kids. And this is where we're going to start today, Genesis chapter 25, verses 19 to 26. It says, this is the account of the family of Isaac, the son of Abraham. When Isaac was 40 years old, he married Rebecca, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean from Padam, Padan Aram, and the sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac pleaded with the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was unable to have children. The Lord answered Isaac's prayer, and Rebekah became pregnant with twins. But the two children struggled with each other in her womb. So she went to ask the Lord about it. Why is this happening to me, she asked. The Lord told her, the sons in your womb will become two nations. From the beginning, the two nations will be rivals. One nation will be stronger than the other, and your older son will serve your younger son. I'm going to pause there for a second. In this short scripture, we see a couple of different themes. Actually, they're reoccurring themes that you see in the life of Abraham, his grandfather. One is this idea of God selecting the second son. So it's interesting, this, this really sticks out, especially in an ancient Near Eastern context where there's two children, they're twins. Now obviously, they are uh, pretty much the same age, but within, within a Middle Eastern context, the older son is the one that is seen as going to receive the inheritance, take on the family line and, and receive the blessing from their parents. This is really, really big in an ancient Near Eastern context. It always has to be the first child. And even though they're twins, one is going to come out first, and that's going to be considered the oldest child. And so right from the beginning in, the, in this womb of Rebecca, God points out that actually it's not going to be the oldest son. I'm going to completely circumvent your culture, and I'm choosing the second son. The promise that I've given you, that I gave to Abraham, that I've given you, Isaac, is now going to flow through your second child. And this hints back to even the story of Abraham, where Abraham first had Ishmael. Ishmael wasn't the chosen one for the promise to flow through. It was going to be Isaac, the second child of Abraham. The second thing that might stick out to you when you read this story is the fact that right away, Rebecca is having trouble having children. And this, when you read the story of Abraham, it reminds you of Sarah. Sarah can't have kids either. And in this story, it's, there's about a 20-year gap from the time that Isaac and Rebekah get married. Isaac is about 40 years old. To the time they have Jacob and Esau, he's now 60. There's this 20-year gap. She's struggling to have kids. Now, this is massive in the ancient Near Eastern culture in the sense that the people of that time really looked upon having children as God or God's blessing on your life. 
if you couldn't have kids, they looked at it as like a curse. Something is wrong with you. You've done something wrong. You've sinned. The God or gods, depending on your belief, are cursing you. And yet in this story, these people that God has chosen can't have children. Abraham and Sarah couldn't have kids. Now Isaac and Rebekah can't have kids. What is the theme here? What's going on? When I read this story, I feel like there's this aspect where God is looking down and he's teaching them many things through this process. And one of it is that actually your blessing of having kids ultimately flows through me. It flows through me. It actually has nothing to do with you. In their, in their cultural context, it has everything to do with them, what they do right, what they do wrong. In both these situations, it has nothing to do with what they've done right or what they've done wrong. But it has everything to do with God's timing and his will and his purposes and his choosing that he's going to bless them. Ultimately, God is the one that's in control. They're not the ones in control. God is in control. So let's dive back in here. Verse 24 says, When the time came to give birth, Rebecca discovered that she did indeed have twins. The first one was very red at birth and covered with thick hair like a fur coat. What an interesting looking child. Now, a lot of babies come out red. This kid had hair. Can't, could not have been a good looking kid. So they named him Esau. Then the other twin was born with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So they named him Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when the twins were born. Now, in, especially in the Hebrew Scriptures, but oftentimes throughout the Bible, names always mean something. It's always worth looking into the meaning of the name. Esau, in Hebrew, literally sounds like the word hair. So this kid comes out all hairy, and they choose a name for him that sounds like the Hebrew word hair. It doesn't sound like a name you want to give your kid, right? But Esau is also the founder of the Edomite kingdom. And Edom means red in Hebrew. So this kid comes out red and hairy. They name him Hair, basically. And he's founder of the Edomite kingdom, which means red. Jacob, on the other hand, is born. And Jacob means heel, right? He was grasping the heel of his brother as he was coming out. But Jacob also means deceiver. And this is going to play out time and time and time again over Jacob's life. It's this prophetic word into Jacob's life of what he's going to be like. Like the video showed that we just watched, the story of Isaac and Rebekah and their children really is a story of dysfunctionality. Sometimes when we read the Bible, it's, you know, we're reading these people and they're considered heroes of the faith. And so we read about their story and we go and go, that's, I don't understand, that seems really kind of broken and messed up. I'm confused because these are heroes of the faith. And, and one of the things we need to distinguish is, yeah, they're heroes of the faith, but they represent us in the fullness of humanity, just like us. They're broken people. And they constantly make mistakes. And one thing that you see through the story of these people is God's blessing on them, his forgiveness for them, and his involvement in their lives despite their brokenness, despite their mistakes, despite all the messed up things that they did, God stuck with them. He promised to be with them, and he didn't leave them in the midst of this. So in this story, you have Jacob and Esau, and they're constantly struggling. Esau was, was a guy that his, his father loved. Isaac loved Esau because Esau was an outdoorsy kind of guy. You know, he's, he's the son that, that you take out fishing and hunting with, and you go camping with, and he's a man of the outdoors, and he uses his hands, and, and, and he just loves to go out and hunting and getting game and then cooking it. And for Isaac, he's like, yes, that's my son. 
and he loves them. And Jacob is complete opposite to Esau. Jacob just wants to hang out at home. He ends up hanging out with his mom. And he's kind of a homebody, and he doesn't have hair, and he's kind of smooth-skinned, and he's not, he doesn't have rough hands, he doesn't work with his hands, he does a little bit of gardening, and, and he cooks, and he learns to cook with his mom, and his mom loves Jacob. And so here you have this dysfunctionality where you have these two parents who are totally opposites, and they've chosen which child is preferred. Esau, in one story, goes out and he's, and he's, been, he's out a long time. He's been, hunt, he's been hunting and he comes back. And he, and he obviously didn't take food with him when he went out hunting. He comes back and he's starving. And here Jacob is at home, the homebody, and he's made some lentil stew. And Esau comes in and he's like, give me some of your stew. And Jacob, the deceiver, is looking at the situation. Esau's the oldest Esau's the one who's going to receive the inheritance. Esau's the one that's going to receive the blessing. And he says to Esau in that moment, you can have some stew if you give me the firstborn inheritance. Now most of us in that moment would be like, yeah, right, for a bowl of stew. But Esau in that moment, all he's thinking about is his hunger. He's not thinking about anything else. He's like, Whatever. Have the inheritance, give me the stew because I'm going to die if I don't eat. In that moment, Jacob deceives Esau out of his firstborn inheritance, which probably would have been a lot of money. We see another story that comes out as as their father Isaac is is getting on in years. Isaac's now blind, he can't see, and Isaac's figuring out that he's probably going to die sometime soon. And in, and in typical Middle Eastern context, in a situation where it was typically not written history, it was oral history, everything was passed down orally from parents to children to children to children. And there's this, this idea within their culture of, of passing on a blessing to their kids. And typically, it would be the oldest child that receives the greatest blessing. And so he, he brings in Esau, and he tells Esau, go out, go hunting for me, go catch something and can cook it for me, and when you come in, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you my blessing. I'm going to give you my verbal blessing. Rebecca hears this, and she tells Jacob, Jacob, this is what's going on. Jacob, go out and get get a young goat from the flock and cook it and, and bring it to your dad. He's blind. He won't be able to see and tell him you're Esau. They end up devising a plan where, where he puts some, some, uh, some uh, animal skins on his arms and his hands so that if the dad touches him, he thinks he's Esau because Esau's all hairy. And so Jacob does this. He comes in. He brings the food to his dad. The dad touches his arms. He says, you kind of sound like Jacob, but you feel like Esau. Okay. And he gives his verbal blessing to Jacob, the second born. We have a situation here where Jacob, the deceiver, has now stolen from his brother twice over. Twice over. Esau catches wind of this. He knows what has happened. You can imagine the the tension between these two young men and the hatred that is boiled between them. And he he declares, you know, once dad dies, once Isaac dies, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him. Rebecca, the mom, catches word of this and sends Jacob away. She says, "Go go to my family up north. Go escape. Your brother's going to kill you. Take off to my family. Go live with my family up there. And so Jacob now is on the run. He's on the run from his life. He's on his run from, from his brother. Probably his entire life, he's been told by his mother that he is the chosen one. God told Rebecca. This is the child of the promise. The promise is going to flow through the second child. And he's been told his whole life, you are the chosen one. And yet everything he has done up at this point is completely underhanded. Now he's on the run. Where is God in the midst 
of this. I see this story and there's this promise that has been given to Jacob. And yet once again, there's this theme that you see in this story of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and throughout the Old Testament of God's wanting to bless us. And yet there is a distrust that there's towards God and we have to go out and we have to take it for ourselves. Can I believe that God is just going to bless me? Or do I have to make it happen on my own terms? So he takes off, and here we have a story in Genesis chapter 28. It says, Meanwhile, Jacob left Beersheba and traveled towards Haran. At sundown, he arrived at a good place to set up camp and stopped there for the night. Jacob found a stone to rest his head against and lay down to sleep. I don't know about you, but sleeping on a stone doesn't sound good. As he slept, he dreamed of a stairway that reached from the earth up to heaven. And he saw the angels of God going up and down the stairway. At the top of the stairway stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your grandfather Abraham, and the God of your father Isaac. The ground you are lying on belongs to you. I'm giving it to you and your descendants. Your descendants will be as numerous as the dust of the earth. They will spread out in all directions to the west and to the east, to the north and the south. And all the families of the earth will be blessed through your descendants. Now, if you've been reading previously, this sounds really familiar. It's basically the same promise that God has given Abraham, his grandfather, the same promise that he gave to Isaac, his father. And now he's having this dream, and God is speaking to him, and the same promise is flowing to Jacob, despite his circumstances. But one thing I want to point out when it comes to finding Jesus in the Old Testament is this, is this aspect All the families of the earth will be blessed through you and your descendants. How is that possible? How is it that the Jewish nation has blessed the entire world? Ultimately, that is only fulfilled in Jesus. All the way back in the story, God is leaving little hints and tips. It's only through Jesus that all the world is going to be blessed. What's more, I am with you, and I will protect you wherever you go. One day I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I finish giving you everything I've promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Sure, the Lord is in this place. And I wasn't even aware of it. But he was also afraid and said, What an awesome place this is. It is none other than the house of God, the very gateway to heaven. The next morning, Jacob got up very early. He took the stone he had rested his head against, and he set it upright as a memorial pillar. Then he poured olive oil over it. He named that place Bethel, which means house of God, although it was previously called Luz. Such a fascinating story. What a fascinating dream. Now, one thing I need to point out is that when we look at dreams in the Bible, the people of an ancient Near Eastern culture looked at dreams very different from us. For us in modern Western culture, when we have dreams, what do you think about when you wake up? Either you think, man, I, sh- I must have ate something weird when I went to bed, or what was I reading or what was I watching on TV before? Why did I dream that? Oftentimes in Western culture, when we think about dreams, we also think about our own psychology. It tells us something about ourselves. But that's not how they thought. So when we look at the Bible, when we look at ancient Near Eastern context, we need to understand that for them, when they received a dream, it didn't tell them something about themselves. They believed it told them something about the cosmos. They believed that it told them something about the unseen realm, something about reality that they cannot see with their physical eyes. And that's why you see all through the Bible where people have dreams and they're trying to figure out what it means is because they took their dreams incredibly seriously. In this dream, it's so fascinating because Jacob has heard all about Abraham's encounters with God. 
He's heard about his dad's encounters with God, and he's heard about this promise, but he's never experienced it before. And in this story, you get a sense that Jacob, for the first time, is experiencing the God of his parents for himself. He's experiencing the God of his fathers for himself. When I read this story, I just, I have to say to you and all the kids sitting here today and watching online that you might have grown up in a Christian home. You might have grown up with like Christian values and morals and told the stories and maybe even your parents' stories of their experiences with God. And that might take you a certain path and journey. It might take you so far. But at some point in time, you have to have your own experience with God. If you don't, eventually it's just going to become somebody else's story that is not real to you, it's not in your heart, and you walk away from it because all it is is stories. But for Jacob here in this moment, all of a sudden it became more than just stories that he's heard before. It became something that he owned. It became something of his own. And for us, it is so important. We can't conjure up experiences. But we can't just sit back and relax on the stories and the things that we've heard and been told in the past. But we have to pursue God with all of our heart and say, God, I want to know you. I want to experience you. I want to hear from you. And I believe in all my heart that when we do that, that he will reveal himself to us, that he is faithful, that it will become our own. Another thing that's really interesting, there's so much uh, foreshadowing and allusion to so much stuff in here. So, In Genesis chapter 11, before Abraham even shows up on the scene, there's a story of the Tower of Babel. Maybe you're familiar with it. A story of of these people in this place called Babel, which in many ways is the foreground for this foreshadowing of of the city of Babylon. And Babylon in the Bible represents so much of of human kingdoms, us doing things our own way, us doing things away from God. And in the story of the Tower of Babel, it's a story of people building a tower or, or a building to get as close to God as they could because in the ancient Near Eastern world, they believed that God was up there. We kind of refer to that still in modern day times, but we understand and recognize that God isn't in this physical place up there. But they literally felt that way, that God was up there. Literally. And so they're building this tower to get towards God. And in this story, God sees what's going on and goes, "Uh uh-uh, no, 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 no. You can't reach to me. And the story says that he confused their languages so they couldn't communicate anymore and continue building this and they're all scattered now i want you to look at this story and what are the similarities and what are the differences god reveals himself to jacob and it's this ladder or stairway to heaven but the difference is is that it's not something that man has created in their own power and in their own strength but it's something that god has done you want to know your way to me It's not something that you can make happen. It's not something you can conjure up. It's something that I am going to do for you. It's an act of God. In the story, he has this experience, and and he's like, man, this place is special, and he calls the place Bethel, which means house of God. Do you know that Gateway City Church, its original name was Bethel? When this church was started over 50 years ago, they called it Bethel, which means house of God. Jacob has this experience. He's like, we're going to rename this. And, and, and for them at that period of time, it, it definitely meant something. It brought back memories. When they looked at the place called Bethel, they go, yeah, I remember that time. Remember that time when God revealed himself to us. But what we see in the life of Jesus is that God doesn't specifically 
choose a specific spot to show himself or to live anymore. But that place called Bethel has now become you. God's desire is that he would never choose physical locations to be a holy place to reveal himself to us, but that you would be the holy place. That he would come and live inside of you. That you would become the Bethel. You are the new covenant Bethel. You've become the house of God. Kind of cool, hey? So much in this. I mean, when, when the ancient Jewish people looked at, at this ladder to heaven, they were looking at it, and, and they were always asking themselves, what's their symbolism to this? What does this mean? And so for ancient Jewish rabbis, when they looked at that ladder or that stairway to heaven, they were like, what does that represent? And for them, they're like, it represents the Torah, it represents the Old Testament law. So God's given us the Torah, and as long as we obey that, that is our stairway to heaven. Sometimes they looked at that, and they're like, that represents the temple and the temple sacrifices that God has given us. And so that is our stairway to heaven. We obey the law, we go to the temple where God lives, and we do our sacrifices, and that is the ladder to heaven. Jesus shows up on the scene, and like everything Jesus does, he reinterprets it for us. He says, I know this is what you've been thinking in the past, but this is what it really means. John chapter 1, I'm going to start in verse 48. This is at the very beginning as Jesus is calling his disciples. He has this interaction with a guy named Nathaniel. It says, how do you know about me, Nathaniel asked. Jesus replied, I could see you under the fig tree before Philip found you. Nathanael exclaimed, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, the King of Israel. Jesus asked him, do you believe this just because I told you I'd seen you under the fig tree? You'll see greater things than this. Then he said, I tell you the truth. You will all see heaven open and the angels of God going up and down on the Son of Man the one who is the stairway between heaven and earth. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? They knew exactly what Jesus was talking about. For us, if we're not aware of the story, we read that and go, oh, that's, a, geez, that's an interesting metaphor. What do you mean by that? Jesus is taking them all the way back to Jacob. He says, remember that story? Remember that, that experience that Jacob had and there's a stairway between earth and heaven, and for thousands of years, you guys have been trying to figure out what that stairway is and what it represents. It's not the Torah. It's not the temple. It's none of those things. He says, actually, I'm the stairway. I'm the stairway. You've been trying to figure out how to get your way to God. Do we build a temple? Do we build a building to get to heaven? Do we do do good things? Do we make enough sacrifices? What is it that we do? And Jesus just points to himself. He says, I am the stairway between heaven and earth. He's still that stairway, you guys. He's still our connection between heaven and earth. There's this old song. It's not really that old, but if you're, if you're aware of Led Zeppelin, if there's any Led Zeppelin fans in the building, even if you're not a fan of Led Zeppelin, you'd be aware of the song Stairway to Heaven. And it's interesting, you know, I'm not like, not 100%, like I know this song, but like this week I was looking at the lyrics, and to be honest with you, most of the lyrics make no sense to me at all. It, I, I could be wrong, but it comes across to me like maybe they were just a little bit on drugs. The only part of the song that makes sense to me is this first part where it says, there's a lady who's sure all that glitters is gold, and she's buying a stairway to heaven. When she gets there, she knows if the stores are all closed, with a word, she can get what she came for. Oh, 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 and she's buying a stairway to heaven. I'm sure that there is some deeper meaning in that. 
But when I read that, what comes out to me is this idea of, of us making our way to heaven. Us, whether it's buying it, like in this, it's kind of I'm going to buy it, I'm going to make it happen on my own. And uh, we're really independent people. We want to make things on our own. But it's so apparent in the message of the Bible that it's just not possible. That we cannot do it on our own. The stairway to heaven is not something that we can buy. It's not something we can earn. But it's something that is given to us as a gift through Jesus Christ. So I want to take you to one last story. And then we're going to have a conversation, some Q&A, if you guys want to engage in that. And we're going to have some responsive worship. Jacob's story is just packed, actually, with stuff. And I can't go over his entire story, but Jacob does. He runs away to his, in, his, his mother's parents up north, his cousins, and he lives up there. And I'm not going to read all the story, but Jacob gets married multiple times, actually. <laughs> he has lots of kids. And there's this kind of unhealthy relationship with, between him and his father-in-law, and his father-in-law deceives him. There's this kind of this constant story of deception. <laughs> his father-in-law deceives him. Jacob's trying to deceive him. And finally, he takes his family and is like, we got to head back home. We're going to go and we're going to settle back home where I'm from. And they start heading south. But you know what's in Jacob's mind. He's heading home, but he also knows his brother is there. What's going to happen when he meets his brother? Is his brother going to kill him? And so he starts devising a plan of how he's going to, like, you know, give all sorts of gifts to Esau, try and smooth things over with him. And in the middle of this story, once again, he's on the cusp of meeting his brother, and, and he sends his family ahead of him, and he spends the night alone, and he has another dream. Maybe it wasn't a dream. It was an experience. Genesis chapter 32 starts in verse 22. It says, During the night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two servant wives and his 11 sons, and crossed the Jabok River with them. After taking him to the other side, he sent over all his possessions. This left Jacob all alone in the camp, and a man came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. When the man saw that he would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of its socket. Then the man said, let me go for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Why would he ask a stranger to bless him? Jacob knows there's something else going on here. What is your name, the man asked. He replied, Jacob. Your name will no longer be Jacob, the man told him. From now on, you'll be called Israel because you have fought with God and with men and have won. Please tell me your name, Jacob said. Why do you want to know my name, the man replied. Then he blessed Jacob there. Jacob named the place Peniel, which means face of God. For he said, I've seen God face to face Yet my life has been spared. I don't know about you, but that's a really strange story. If I'm 100% honest. But it's interesting how Jacob recognizes that there's more going on there than just him wrestling with a man. He recognized that he was actually wrestling with God. Jacob is actually renamed through this occurrence through this experience and he's renamed Israel and that's where the nation of Israel gets its name it date it goes back to this occurrence and and the name of Israel means God rules that's one way of interpreting the name of Israel God rules you see in the story God definitely ruled it also can mean one who struggles with God one who struggles 
with God. When we look at this story, it's the question has always been, who is wrestling with Jacob? And some theologians have looked at this and said this is what's called a Christophany. A Christophany is this idea of, of people experiencing the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. That even though it seemed like a man, it was actually God. And there's several stories like that that, that pop up in the Old Testament where this man shows up. Is it an angel? Is it a man? Is it God? No one's really quite sure. But as Christians looking back, they say, ah, I think maybe this is a Christophany. It's an appearance of Jesus before he shows up in the New Testament. Jacob at this point in his life is continuing what he always does. Is he does things in his own strength. He does stuff on his own, in his own way, in his own deceiving way. And now he's about to face his past. He's about to face Esau face to face. And just like previously where he had a dream where he's running away from Esau, now he's having to face Esau. And you can imagine maybe the things that are running through his mind going back to the promise, God, are you going to continue to bless me? Is this the end? What does the future hold for me? And what's interesting in this story is that it's God who shows up. It's God who shows up and engages Jacob. It's God who shows up and starts to wrestle with Jacob. And they have this wrestling match. And if you've ever wrestled with God, you should know that you typically don't win. Because even when it feels like you've won, God reaches out and he, it says he touches his, his hip, his socket, and wrenches it out of place. And God ends up winning that wrestling match. It's representative of a lot of stuff, you guys. Something tells me is that Jacob was never the same after that experience. He always walked with a limp. He probably didn't go to rehab he didn't have a doctor look after it. He was never the same, and he walked with a limp, and that limp always reminded him of that experience with God. When it was all said and done, though, he lost the battle. He knew he was face-to-face -face with God, and he's like, will you bless me? I do want to let you go until you bless me. God doesn't bless Jacob in this occurrence because he has to, because he's, he's lost some sort of wrestling match with Jacob, because it's very obvious that he won. But there's this idea of God wanting to bless Jacob. Why? Just because? Because he's chosen him? Because he wants to bless him? And Jacob has wrestled with God. And it's interesting, you don't get this sense that God is upset with, with Jacob for wrestling with him. In fact, it's God who engaged him in that wrestling match. You know what? God wants us to wrestle with our faith. Wrestling with God and wrestling with our faith is not a bad thing. But as we wrestle with our faith, we have to take that journey to its end. End conclusion. I've seen so many people give up on faith as they encounter situations like this. They encounter difficult situations in their life, like Jacob is facing Esau, and they look back on their life and they decide, God's never been with me. It's all been a joke. It's all been a mistake. He's never blessed me. I've always done this on my own, and I'm just giving up, and I'm, I'm throwing, packing in my faith. Through life, we need to wrestle out. There's a scripture that Phil read earlier about working out our salvation. 
it's interesting to know it's not working for our salvation, but it's working out our salvation. It's this aspect of exercising it, of wrestling with it, of wrestling with stuff. I have to be 100% honest with you. I'm a pastor. I've been for many years. I'm 43 years old. I've walked with God for many, many years, and I'm still wrestling through my faith. I'm still asking questions. I'm still saying, God, what about this? And what about this? And what about this? And it has nothing to do with giving up on my faith. It has everything with, with saying, God, I know that you're good. I know that you want to reveal yourself to me. And I'm going to continue to wrestle with this. I'm going to continue to wrestle with you until you show me. Hey, I'm Tim. And I'm Colin. And uh, if you don't know who we are, that's fine. Yeah. A lot of people don't. We're half of Tim and the Glory Boys. And uh, we're coming to your town. That's right. The Summer Nights Under String Lights Tour is coming to Kamloops. That is correct. It's happening at Gateway City Church Friday, July 17th. Mm -hmm. There's only a limited amount of tickets available per showing, so we're doing two. One at 6.30 p.m. and one at 9 p.m. That's right. It's going to be a foot stomping, hand clapping hoedown, and you can get your tickets at Timmy Tour. Y'all better get your tickets or the puppy gets it. And by it, I mean Belly Rocks! When you know, you know. I'm walking on cloud nine, I'm seeing all the signs. Once again, thanks for connecting with us today. I pray that encouraged you and spurred you on in your spiritual journey. If you would like someone to pray for you, and you are watching live off our website through Church Online, there's a prayer button you can press and someone is waiting right now to pray for you. If you're watching a recorded version, I would like to direct you to our website where you can fill out a prayer request form. We would also like to point you towards and encourage you in being able to support our ministry financially. If you go to the giving link on our webpage, it lists all the ways you could give electronically from the comfort of your own home. Thanks for supporting us in this way. God bless.